Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the second Sunday of Easter, as we continue to celebrate Christ's victory over sin and death, and as we give praise and honor and glory to him as the one who is risen, who is reigning and ruling over all of creation. I want to welcome all of you who are uh, worshiping with us uh, as we continue our online worship, and just know that uh, even though we are separated physically, that God's Spirit, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, connects us as one body. And so whether you are part of the Royal Oak Church family, uh, friends, relatives, neighbors, uh, or whoever might be viewing this video, we pray that God's peace and His grace might dwell in your hearts rich, richly as we worship together. I want to remind you also that we do have an interactive online gathering uh, by way of Zoom on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., uh, also at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. So I hope that you can join us during one of those occasions as well, just a, a time of more informal sharing and praying for one another and sharing some scripture together, uh, reflecting on scripture together and sharing joys and concerns and uh, just a, a nice way to stay connected in these uh, strange and unprecedented days. Uh, but we know that God walks with us through whatever circumstance we are experiencing. And we are confident that he will use uh, even these hard times uh, to draw us closer to him and glorify himself in our hearts and minds. So join me now as we join together in our call to worship. This is a unison reading from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. What joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. O Lord God of heaven's armies, hear our prayer. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. And now continue worshiping with us as we sing, Because He Lives. Day. Ah. 
Let us bow together in prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, that from your hand all blessings flow. And we pray, Lord, that we might receive so that we might be generous in our own giving, that we might be made full, that your love would overflow into the lives of the people around us. Lord, we confess that we are broken, that we are sinners, and that we are saved solely by grace through faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith in these troubled days. We pray, Lord, that despite our isolation from one another, that we might continue to consider others before ourselves and that we might put others' needs above our own. Help us to live lives of generosity generous in love, generous in thought, generous in time, generous in gifts. And Lord, we present our tithes and our offerings to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would take whatever we offer for your glory. And we acknowledge, Lord, that whatever we offer is really a sign and symbol of an even deeper discipleship, and that, in fact, our whole lives belong to you. And so we, we offer ourselves at the altar as a living sacrifice, and we ask that you would use us in new and creative ways, Lord, to, to love one another, to love neighbors in need. And we um, present these tithes and offerings in Jesus' name. Amen. Give place to sigh. 
And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And I know he watches me. We had been fishing all night and had caught nothing. We were weary and discouraged. Jesus had told us that we would see him again and for us to go ahead to Galilee. But so far, nothing. I wasn't even sure that I was still considered a disciple. I certainly wasn't worthy of that title. After all, I had denied even knowing Jesus, not once, but three times on that terrible night before his death, just as Jesus had predicted. As we waited for Jesus to appear once again, I figured I might as well do something familiar, something to take my mind off my guilt and my failure on that awful night. But as I sat In the boat with an empty net, I felt as if I had almost forgotten how to fish. It was the worst night of fishing in my life. Not a bite, not a nibble. I'd been a fisherman all my life. Passed down from my father to my brother Andrew and I. I am Simon Barjona, or as you would say, Simon, son of John. You probably know me better by the name which Jesus of Nazareth gave to me when I became one of his disciples. Petros, or Peter, as you say. It means rock, which is a funny name for a fisherman, as I spend a lot of time on the water. You might have heard about my little escapade on the water with Jesus, and I went to him and was able to go to him even walking on the water until I began to look at the wind and the waves and my focus was taken away from Jesus and I began to sink like a what? Like a rock, like a Petros. But that is another story for another time. But lately I hadn't really lived up to my name. I hadn't been a rock the kind of rock that my friends, my fellow disciples needed. I've always prided myself on my strength, but that all seemed to fade away that terrible night when the people there at Jesus' trial began to ask me if I knew Jesus, if I was one of his disciples. I have to admit that I was terrified. I sensed that my very life was being threatened. I never would have believed that Jesus, the one that we had placed our hopes in, the one that 
was clearly, in our minds, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, the chosen one, the one that would rule us all and be king. I never imagined that he would be arrested by our own chief priests. It was beyond belief. It was just a strange and really unexplainable time. What were they thinking? Didn't they see this same man do some of the same miracles that we had witnessed over the last three years, especially these last few months? Didn't they understand that it was this Jesus that had healed the sick, that had made the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear? Didn't they understand that this man was full of grace and love and truth? That he had even br brought the dead to life again? I realize now why Jesus said so often, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I always thought that is a strange thing to say. Of course we have ears. What does he mean? But I've come to realize that in fact, we often only hear what we want to hear. That our ears and our hearts and our minds are very much connected. And that if our hearts are hardened or our minds are closed to truth, that our ears might just as well be stuffed with straw. Friends, do you have ears that are open, ears that are ready to hear, hearts that are open, minds that are teachable? Is your, hope, is your heart open to what Jesus might teach you? How he might reveal himself to you? Is your heart open to receive the good news that Jesus is alive and that the tomb is empty and that Jesus has risen from the grave and conquered sin and death and that Jesus wants to give you and me a fresh start, a new beginning and make us into new men, new women, a new person. Perhaps through the trials and difficulties of life in this broken world, you, like me at times, have grown cynical and cold. Perhaps you have lost hope in your ears and your heart and mind are closed. Well, today I want to share with you a brief story of a time when I went fishing for fish, but caught hope instead. As I said earlier, I had grown bored just sitting around all day waiting for Jesus to appear again. We were near the Sea of Galilee, and as we approached the shore, some of my friends and I, Thomas and James and John and Nathaniel and a couple of others, I said to them, I'm going out to fish. And they said, we'll go with you. So we went out into the boat. But as I said, we fished all night and caught nothing. Some fishermen we were. Well, early in the morning, a man stood away on the shore, which wasn't too far off. It was in fact Jesus, but we did not realize it at the time. And he called out to us, friends, have you caught any fish? Now that is not the question that fishermen who have failed to catch anything all night want to hear. No, we answered, somewhat irritated by the question. He said, throw your, no your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Yes, yes, the right side, oh, why did I not think of that? Yes, of course, the right side. I thought in my mind, but held my tongue. 
I started to unload and give him a piece of my mind. I was tired and cranky and I didn't really appreciate some stranger telling me, a lifelong fisherman, how to fish. But I restrained myself, thankfully, and I can't exactly explain why other than there was something familiar in that stranger's voice. So despite my cynicism, despite my closed mindedness and my doubts, I said, all right, we'll try one more time before we head in. Let's cast the net on the right side, just as the man says, and see what happens. Now at first, nothing happened. The net just lay there. And I thought to myself, just as I thought. But then, the water began to stir. And I looked, and there was a fish caught in the net. And in just a few moments, there were two fish, and then a dozen, and then 20, and then a 100, and then a whole cascade of fish filling the net. It was a miracle. This net had been empty all night, and here it was full again. It was a miracle. A miracle. I looked back again at that man at the shore. I tried to look closely to see who is he? That stranger who had so suddenly appeared. And then John turned to me and said, Peter, it is the Lord. Now John is younger than I and has better eyesight, but he also has a more sensitive heart and spirit. And as soon as I heard his words, I knew that John was right. This was the Lord. This wasn't just any man. This wasn't a stranger. And as soon as I heard him say it is the Lord, I, I grabbed my outer garment around myself. And like a fool, I, I jumped in the water. And at once I began to sink. I began to sink just like a rock, just like my namesake would indicate. Thankfully, it wasn't very deep, and after struggling a bit, I was awkwardly swimming, getting to shore as quickly as possible. But as I said, we weren't too far out, and soon I was running on the sandy bottom toward the shore, and I crossed the 100 yards or so in no time. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, when we reached the shore, we saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to us, friends, come, bring some fish you've just caught and join me here at the fire. So I climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 to be exact. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to us, come, let us sit down and have breakfast together. Now, none of us dared ask him, who are you? We all knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took some bread and gave it to us. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to us after he had been raised from the dead. After we had finished eating, Jesus took me aside and we talked just one on one. I was nervous and a little afraid of what Jesus might say to me. Would he rebuke me? Would he let me down gently that I was no longer one of his disciples? But instead, this is what Jesus said. He looked me in the eye and he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Well, I noticed immediately that he wasn't calling me Peter, and my heart sunk. Perhaps I really had been fired. Do I love him more than these, more than these fish, more than these other fishermen, these other disciples, more than my former life of being a fisherman? I wasn't sure what he was asking, but I said, yes, yes, of course, I love you. You know, Lord, that I love you. And Jesus simply said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to me for a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, I answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then a third time, Jesus said to me, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I felt hurt. Jesus didn't seem to be believing me. Had I lost all credibility with him, would I never again be trusted? A million thoughts were racing through my mind. I said pleadingly, Lord, yes, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus put his hand on my shoulder as he said this and a, a wave of peace flooded over me. And I began to realize that just as I had denied Jesus three times that terrible night, Jesus had now restored me back to ministry three times. He had told me over and over to feed his sheep, to care for his lambs. Jesus was offering me a new beginning, a fresh start. Jesus was offering Simon, son of John, to once again become Peter, the rock. God's mercies, you see, my friends, are new every morning. One of the great prophets, Jeremiah, wrote, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. You see, I had gone out to catch fish, but I caught hope instead with Jesus' help. Because of Jesus' mercy, because of Jesus' grace and love, I had hope restored. So friend, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have failed to do, know that Jesus and his mercies never end. They are new every morning. So no matter how heinous you think your sin, no matter how many times you feel you've denied Jesus in your heart or betrayed him, know that those mercies are new every morning. And this, my friends, is a new morning. And those mercies are new and available to you right now. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, because of his perfect sacrifice, the atonement for our sin through the power of the resurrection in which God the Father validated his perfect life and affirmed that indeed God's justice and his wrath had been satisfied in Christ's death. It means that for those of us who believe and trust in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, we are set free and we are no longer slaves to sin and fear. Even death holds no fear for us because we live and move and have our being in the one who has defeated death, in the great victor. We trust in the Lord of lords and the King of kings. 
So I tell you, friends, lift up your hearts to Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, our Savior and Lord, and praise be to the God and Father of Jesus. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Through his resurrection and ascension, Jesus reigns and rules over all the universe, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come one day to take us home to himself, to redeem us and to judge all the living and the dead. Are you ready? Yes, this world is full of sadness and tears and brokenness and sin, full of grief and woe. But as followers of the risen one, we can greatly rejoice. Though for now we have to suffer all kinds of trials. But God allows whatever trials you are currently experiencing so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even when refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. For by faith, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you can still believe in him and be filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. So friends, learn from an old fisherman. An old fisherman who follows a risen carpenter. A carpenter who has been raised to the heavenly heights. A carpenter who now lives and reigns over all and who loves us more than anything, more than his own life. And he stretched out his hands in a loving, eternal embrace. And now this Jesus calls us all to stretch out our hands in loving one another, to live and love as obedient, joyful children of God. For the sadness of this world will one day become a distant memory and our hearts will overflow with laughter and joy and life everlasting. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord God, we praise you that you are a God of glory, a God of grace and might. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that the bonds of death could not hold you and that you are risen and ruling over all things. We're thankful, Lord, that you are a God of mercy and that those mercies are new every morning. And may we, like Peter, learn that you are a God of new beginnings, of second, third, fourth, and many, many chances. Help us, Lord, to begin again and to start afresh every morning. And it will invite you in to fill our empty hearts, our cold hearts, Lord, with the warmth and the love of your Holy Spirit. We give thanks, Lord, that you are always among us and in us. And we pray that we could receive with thanksgiving the new abundant life that you so eagerly desire to give all of your children. In your holy and precious name, we make our prayer. Amen. Friends, as we come toward the conclusion of our worship, I invite you to confess your faith using this classic creed of the Christian church, one of the oldest creeds of all, the Apostles' Creed, as a way of affirming our faith, of reminding ourselves of the foundations of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So friends, go in the grace and peace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, today and every day. And we invite you as we conclude this worship to join in singing that great classic hymn of praise, How Great Thou Art. Shall come, we shall.